it's very hard for me to speak to you as though I'm critical or, or any, because I grew up watching your stuff. My dad took me to Taxi Driver when I was 10, back oh. when it came out. <laughs> and it changed Jeez. my life, you oh know what God. I mean? It's a, it, it, that it's a very vivid film that makes an impression on yeah. you at any age. But, but to his credit, he explained it all to me, I understood things, but I learned a lot through watching your films. And as I have become a filmmaker, that language that you developed is something that's reflected by not just me, but Tarantino and the Hughes brothers and people and, and across the board, pop culture with The Sopranos, Alice, the TV show Alice that came from Alice doesn't yeah, live here anymore. Yeah. You know, so a lot of the people in this room, I would think, grew up watching the stuff. And it's interesting seeing that style develop because you have the use of freeze frame, the use of needle drops, yeah. the use of very subjective camera movement too you're yeah. not a very objective uh no and i, I mean like I, right I really i admire i admire the the classical style but i found that um i kind of saw things in a, in a personal way like for example um people's points of view uh, taxi driver i knew had to be done from uh, travis bickle's point of view and also from his uh, his ear in other words he did, he was a character who did not listen to music on the radio Mm -hmm. So it had to be score. And I find a lot of directors today, and uh, I'm only starting to now uh, for the first time, to really examine what to do beforehand through oh. storyboards, and now you have with computers pre-visualizations. There's yeah. a lot of different yeah, animatics. There's I a know. lot of ways to do it. But you were illustrating your movies before you ever uh, began, sh I, began yeah, shooting Yeah, that was my only way. I, I, I come, my uh, family's working class, uh, New York City, uh, Sicilian, uh, Americans, my mother and father worked in the garment district and never read a book. So there were no books in my house. There was TV and music. And uh, I started dealing with books when I was in really high school, in a sense. Um, and so I was, my whole life was permeated with visual storytelling. And not, not being exposed to literature, um, I, couldn't exp I couldn't express myself verbally, um, be articulate enough, and or certainly not with writing. It was very difficult. I wish I could, but it's very hard. Um, and uh, I found I started drawing pictures and drawing little uh, news, um, in the newspapers, the comic strips, mm -hmm. drawing little comic strips. You, know, you could draw pictures on the edge, uh, on the margins of the book. And, and uh, you make each, you draw a little stick figure and the hand is raising. And the next one, you draw the same stick figure, the hand is a little higher. Next one, a little higher. And so then you flip it and they oh, move. Flip, flip, right. And that's when I started to then transfer those um, that concept of motion into frames, uh, and not having having had terrible asthma when I was a kid, and for a long period of time, I was about 45 or so, uh, uh, being b made to believe that I could not do any exercise, I could not do any uh, athletics, uh, and I was always sort of protected and that sort of thing. Basically, uh, my only way of, of using my imagination was to make those pictures and make these little stories, and ultimately, that's what I prize most now in the editing room. It's almost as if I'm back in this little room and uh, right. making these little drawings. Mean Streets and, and also actually Who's That Knocking was the first time that you did something that really influenced a whole generation of filmmakers, certainly myself. And that's not using score, but instead using needle drops and songs to help create a mood and create a reality in a sequence yeah. uh, instantly yeah. that would be very difficult to do. For me, score is of... Um well, I love the scores, the, old, the older uh, the, the classical cinema. But when I started to get to make films, I found that um, the scores were not the way I wanted to go. Uh, I found that my life would always been scored by source music that was coming right. from a radio or records or across the street in a jukebox and uh, in a car. And images would come to mind and very, very uh, ironic, uh, if you want to call it, counterpoint to uh, certain scenes I was seeing while this music is being played mm -hmm. in reality. And um, I wanted to reflect that reality, but also become, have the source music become score and take over, uh, which meant uh, not only the sound of the music, the, that is the, uh, the type of song it was, but also the lyrics mm -hmm. inter interwoven between dialogue uh, as the actors are speaking. Well, it usually juxtaposes. A lot of times it's a, it's, it, it's, it gets a laugh. I mean, it's funny because yeah. it creates a certain um, disconnection or a certain understanding the irony of a situation, yeah. especially, I mean, just Mean Streets, the way it starts off with, with Be My Little Baby, oh, right? Be my baby. It just said you just you're just in your seat, and then there's a you, you opted to have the frame within the frame, so you felt like you're the watching the movie. movies. You see, yeah, the home movies. Some of them are actually my brother's home movies, mixed in with some stuff that we uh -huh. mixed with an eight millimeter camera. It was very much a home movie made at home in a sense, and even the titles were typed out by me and then blown up. 
I was influenced, but yeah, by that score. I mean, there was, there was of course, uh, I, a friend of mine and I tried to put together an eight millimeter film. I borrowed his camera and uh, we did a silly thing. We're about 18 years old or something and we shot it on the roofs in New York. It was an embarrassing uh, little film. And uh, we showed it in my, my, my apartment, my mother and father's apartment. They went out one Saturday night and invited my friends over and we screened it. And we, put, we had to put the music on our, we had no idea what synchronization was, but we didn't have a soundtrack. So I would just play a record from one section. Mm -hmm. And the music, that's when it started. The music was, uh, oh, uh, Prokofiev, um, uh, music from Alexander Nevsky, and then Django Reinhardt, mm -hmm. Club of France, and Lonnie Donegan. Mm -hmm. And so it was all eclectic music uh, up there for this silly little film that we were doing. And then, of course, about two years later, I saw Scorpio Rising, Kenneth Anger's experimental film, uh, Scorpio Rising, which used music that way and which blasted open all the possibilities, you see. And what's, what's awful, I mean, this segues into a different discussion, but if you have a low-budget film, there's no better way to add feeling and production value and immediacy yeah, to a, a moment on film is to pick the right song that puts that dials everybody in exactly to where you want yeah, them to be yeah. without manipulating them with like a swelling string that's section. That's the problem, yeah, that's the problem, Ma manipulation of a lot of the scores today. But I think also what happens today in uh, a lot of the use of these uh, two things, one in the needle drops, as you call them, uh, are songs just automatically to give you nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of think that's kind of... It's like the use, almost like the use of sepia yeah. since Godfather 2. Yeah, Everybody's exactly. making the film yeah, yellow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I just think that's kind of, well, yeah, it puts you back in that time, but it's, I, wish the film was, I wish that music was used a little more creatively. But it depends on the filmmaker. I mean, uh, uh, it really depends on what you're doing. And uh, the use of score, too, over the years, you find certain scenes um, where people are talking, it's very tense, and there's long pauses or there's silence between certain lines. Um, there's a tendency to put score way under or tone mm -hmm. so that it relieves the audience of the tension. Well, no, that's, that's the tension. Now, you, you know, mm -hmm. if a person gets up in the audience and leaves, I, I mean, I, we lost them, okay. Yeah. But the point is, try not to undercut and say psychologically or subconsciously to the audience, it's really all right. Don't worry, this person's not gonna get up and do something outrageous. Uh, it's not gonna get up and really up, be upsetting and it's not gonna be that upsetting a scene. Maybe it will be. And if you wanna sit there and watch it, fine. If not, made it clear that you're big on story but not big on plot and I'd like mm. you to just talk about the difference between story and plot if you would. I just found that over the years I was more drawn to um, the films that I that I constantly revisited or, or saw repeatedly uh, held up longer for me over the years um, not because of plot but because of character and um, a very different approach to story you know just for example talk about Hitchcock and we, we um, see his films in the 50s as they came out um, Strangers on a Train, Rear Window, all the way up to, uh, uh, you know, Vertigo, uh, North by Northwest, then into Psycho. But I think over the years, the films of, of Hitchcock that I enjoy watching repeatedly, uh, The Wrong Man, for example, as a picture that I, I, I've used repeatedly as an example of um, um, mood, paranoid style, mm -hmm. uh, beautiful New York uh, uh, location photography, uh, it was a picture that I screened for Michael Chapman, Paul Schrader, and everybody for Taxi Driver. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe ultimately it's one of the reasons I said Bernard Herrmann had to do the score. You know, I think so. And, and uh, uh, I talked about the uh, paranoid camera moves, uh, the feelings of threat. Uh, when, uh, if you know the picture, Henry Fonda has to go to the uh, pay in, uh, paying us insurance uh, in Queens. I, I, was, I, was, I grew up a little bit, I grew up till about seven years old in Queens. So Me too. The, the Jamaica and that whole area. So. It was kind of interesting to see it, but he's, he's standing behind the uh, counter and the woman's looking over and she, you see Henry Fonda from her point of view and she thinks he's a robber because he, he had just robbed this place earlier and she thinks he's come back. Uh, and the way the camera moves, her perception, excellent, excellent, excellent bit part players because they could, they could kill you if you don't get the right person. The fear, the anxiety, the paranoia, it's all done through the camera and the person's face. <laughs> I find, I find that that is more interesting to me. So when I, when I, I, I saw Rebecca maybe 10 times, 14 times, and everything, but at a certain point I said, I know, there's no, for me, the style Hitchcock in that film is only in the sequence when Mrs. Danvers shows the, um, uh, uh, Rebecca's room to Joan Fontaine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about it. For the rest of it, I know the plot and it's not interesting anymore. You show violence in a way that isn't cutty. You don't overcut it. You'll, it's like the shot when Leota comes, goes across the street, oh, hits him with the gun, yeah, goes back. Girlfriend, yeah. Incredibly difficult. Much, much easier to stage that with the blood 
hits and all yeah. that stuff with it. Just bury a couple of cuts. I'm sure your effects people were begging you to do it on yeah, yeah, the yeah. day. But you go, he sees them, you go across the street, you catch the POV, he walks into it. What do you want, fucko? You want something? Huh? Oh, hey! Hey! Ah. What are you doing? Beats him with the, with the gun, comes back, yeah, hands back. it to her. Yeah. And then what's great, too, is that your use of inserts. Normally, people, when they use a lot of inserts, it's very cutty. You do it in a way where it is a very subjective impression of what image that person it stays would in your be. mind. It would stay in the character's mind. That moment it's of the, the gun being gun. put, the bloody gun being put into the milk box. And she goes, "I can tell you the truth." She says, "It turned me on." And it's also the use of narration, slow motion. There's a lot of things that that, that slow motion. That, I, I get carried away with it, I guess, and I, I don't know. I, I really like it. Liked works it. though. I don't know. I, I, what I, rate do you shoot at? It, I like 32 frames, 32 or 36 frames, maybe. Um, and in, in Raging Bull, a lot, I mean, unfortunately, we just had to do a lot of um, high, high speed, 96, 120 frames. We couldn't see the punches. Mm -hmm. And says, so, oh, Sam Peckinpah stuff. And I said, well, not really. I said, it was really more that we were trying, we'd shoot this punch uh, in this particular angle, with that kind of a track, the combination of the moving in, the combination of the punch, which also had to be faked, landing in the frame. And when you shot at 24 frames, you didn't see it. Mm -hmm. It went so quick, you didn't see. So I said, what do you want? Oh, 36. Okay, let's do 148, let's do 196 just in case. And then it became that kind of a situation to actually see it. But I, I do like that. You also undercrank a lot. I noticed that there's also a very a signature, like, slam-in, push-in that yeah, you do. Yeah, with, with, Where skip it frames. seems to be, a, oh, you drop frames? Is Sometimes that what you do? Sometimes skip frames. I, you know what it is? It comes from, there, there were films that I saw as, as a child in theaters where um, uh, some of the action... I mean, Hollywood films, Warner Brothers, MGM, that sort of thing. Some of the action would look kind of strange at a certain crucial point. The person would move a certain way. Or well, like Clark Gable in Magambo, there's this moment where he has to be tested by the uh, native tribes, and he, he has to go against a, uh, a wall of a thatched wall, and they throw spears at him. That's sort of a game they do. And there's one more. I know it's fake. I know something is wrong, because there's one moment where he's like this, and he goes like that, and right. the spear is there. And what it is, what it is is that they shot it backwards, uh -huh. and yet it has a certain emotion. Going backwards and skipping frames has that kind of almost a hyper-realistic hyper quality to it that becomes stylized, but that it's almost also saying, look, I'm not interested in making this um, match or to be, quote, realistic, unquote. No, this is the energy of it, see? That's mm -hmm. the energy of it. That's the energy of the situation. You jump out of the car that way, too. You know, it'll look as if you're in skipping frames yourself. You know, if you're <laughs> right, running, yeah. these guys are running after you. You're you're running in, in three frames a second. You know, you're not uh, 24. <laughs> <laughs> but so like, that's yeah. the way. So it's inside the guy's mind in sure. a way. He's running like he's suddenly like a, a wild marionette. Thanks to DVD, I've been able to look at a lot of these shots yeah. over and over because if you're making movies, that's the way you do it. If you're a painter, you go to the museum that's, that's with your I easel. Think. You watch the old masters. That's why I talk about the film preservation. Really, yeah. And what's interesting, too, is looking at, like, who's that knocking? You have westerns in there, and you can I see know, your I Ford tried, influence. I tried, I tried. They were very much reflected in uh, Mean Streets and uh, certainly in uh, uh, Raging Bull, but ma mainly in Goodfellas, is the family, the sense of family mm -hmm. and the sense of uh, humor amongst a, a ensemble playing. And you usually found this in the Ford films going all the way through, uh, well, How Green Was My Valley, and uh, a lot of the westerns or the scenes where uh, Ward Bond brings his posse uh, to the, the, the Texas uh, the, the household in the beginning of the searchers. Uh -huh. And he talks about those, uh, sure, those are good, those are good uh, muffins. Wait a minute, sister, I didn't get any coffee yet. They're drinking that coffee, mm -hmm. and people are running around, the kids are yelling, and it's very much like, um, from the Irish-American tradition, very, related very much to the Italian-American tradition of family. And so um, I, I really translated those things to um, the world I knew. Uh, and so you got the scene in Mean Streets between De Niro and Keitel, the, the improvisation in the back room, is based very much on Hawks or, or Ford. Just don't get in the way. Don't get away, these two guys. And even in the, um, even in, um, oh God, the, the, mother, the scene with my mother in, uh, in uh, Goodfellas, mm -hmm. where everybody's sitting down sure. to eat dinner. Why don't you get yourself a nice girl? That's very much Ford. It's a nice one almost every night. Man. I mean, with the, imp the impulse is Ford, but it becomes something else. That's what I, I mean. settle down almost every night, but then in the morning I'm free. I love you. <laughs> I want to be a... The walking shot that you talked about of, uh, Henry walking across the street to hit that kid uh, who's bothering his girlfriend. That's a, um, take a look at the scene at the end of Red River where John Wayne is walking towards Montgomery Cliffs. He's about to kill him. It's his son. And he's about, yes. to, he's about to have that showdown. And watch how the camera tracks back. Mm -hmm. And the power of Wayne 
uh, the way he moves his body in the frame. And at a certain point, John Ireland calls, calls him. And he turns around, shoots John Ireland. John Ireland shoots him. He turns back towards frame, right in the foreground, and keeps walking, but, but he's shot. Mm -hmm. And the power hasn't diminished mm -hmm. of that tracking shot. It's mm -hmm. exactly the impetus behind that shot. Can I ask you about the aviator? Actually, you can. Um, it, it, now it deals with the aviator story of Howard Hughes, uh, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. Yes. Did did, it, did the subject matter speak to you because of? It seems that his upbringing, his youth, was very similar to the legend of your youth of being a kid who was in the movie houses and not out playing and sort of a little bit sheltered by health or parents. I I, I don't know. All I know is that uh, uh, yeah, there are certain elements of him being sequestered and kind of coddled in a way and. And this guy, though, is, uh, you see, one of the things that I never had, I was never a Howard Hughes enthusiast or, or a person who was obsessed with Howard Hughes. And I knew that uh, a number of wonderful, uh, Warren Beatty, a great filmmaker, who wanted to uh, make a film on Howard Hughes for years. Spielberg did. Um, and so I, I never paid attention. I said, never, Howard Hughes, forget it. I knew the stories about Howard Hughes, uh, and I knew his films. I was one of the kids at, at, at 1950 and 51 who saw his RKO pictures, uh, somewhat baffled by many of them. Um, and so... <laughs> Uh, because he, by that point, was, you know, things were being ruined there at the studio by him. But in any event, um, and I heard about, I heard about this big plane he built. Then I heard basically that he was an older man. I heard the old story of the hermit and the very strange things about him. So, at the gangs of New York, uh, Leo DiCaprio, uh, his, his, um, a lot of his clout actually helped get the picture made, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, through his people, I got the script and it said the aviator. I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm not a fan of flying. So, <laughs> uh, okay. But I, I like, certain kinds of films about flying, particularly films in the 1930s with the William Cameron Menzies design, uh, The Shape of Things to Come, uh, uh, the deco planes, the deco trains, you know? It has a sense of speed and, and uh, wonderful, uh, um, almost like an American frontier in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, in any event, I started reading it and reading it, and I didn't know what it was, and nobody told me anything. And about 20 page, 15 pages in, I said, my God, it's Howard Hughes shooting Hell's Angels. Mm -hmm. And I happen to be a fan of Hell's Angels. I feel that some of the dramatic scenes are pretty rough, but the, if you see it on a big screen, the aviation sequences, to this day, no one could do what he did. Even Wellman did with the wings right before, but not as, uh, not as extreme and as, as, uh, as, as uh, spectacular as what, as what he did in that film. Well, there's some, something cool about a guy throwing eight times the budget of his own money. His in, own money. Making it sound after yeah. it was yeah. silent. And yeah. then when the stuntman refused to fly the plane, he from they jump behind the, the stick and go and do it, crash and walk him. away from the accident. Well, he walked away and said, you're right, it didn't work. <laughs> 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 but he did it. And I'm, I'm reading this thing, and I'm, it goes like 20, it goes from 1927 to 1947. So, oh, it's Howard Hughes. So, oh, everybody wants to do this. I said, wait a minute, this is about Howard Hughes. I didn't know. Um, it deals really with, I think, is the price he paid with his own sanity, mm -hmm. um, uh, to be a man who uh, dealt with the obsession of flying, to deal with the obsession of being a god, really, mm -hmm. being a god who flew in the air. Here's something fascinating, too, um, that really taught me a lot about you as a director. There's a shot, there's a close-up of Sharon Stone in bed in Casino. It's a wonderful close-up, very tight, very uncharacteristically close. It's a sideways shot of her very tight on her face and very emotional moment with her in bed talking to De Niro, I oh, guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. And there's a camera bump in it. You're destroying yourself. You don't need that stuff. You don't need that fucking leech living off you. I know you're better than you yourself. And I'm like, do you know how much guts it takes as a director you can't to, to yeah. say, I'm going to keep that shot in because I feel so strongly about the performance of this actor in this sequence that I'm willing to take the bullet. Yeah. I think you got to do that. In a big Hollywood movie. I mean, that's a big movie. you got to do that. But I mean, uh, regular audience. But most audience, people don't. Regular audience, I mean, you should see. You go look at some of the classic films now, and you say, my God, none of, that, none of those cuts match. But it didn't matter. What do you know? I mean, you're there, and you're watching. Look at that. The camera's bouncing around. It seemed like a smooth shot to me um, when I saw the film. But if you're but there, you it'd had be the overly option. critical. You had the opportunity, though. Oh, to use other though, couldn't do it, but yeah. To use other takes, and you yeah. decided to go with the best performance, is my point. Exactly, yeah. Because I think, I think ultimately, she was so great in it, and... And there was a wonderful moment because uh, she's just cracking up and uh, uh, Bob's character is t trying to give us some hope and some spirit. And uh, it was very moving watching the two of them. And I have a camera bump. We'll have to go with it. If people get annoyed with it, I mean, they're not, 
they're not into the film. You mentioned in your, uh, your, your series on American cinema, you talk about the collaboration between Ford and Wayne and how it starts with Stagecoach. And in essentially the same genre, you have The Searchers many, many Strange, years later, yeah, right? Interesting, yeah. And what I thought when I heard that was, it's interesting that you and De Niro had started with Mean Streets. And in essentially the same genre, you had, uh, which would be the quote unquote gangster genre, I don't know, I another guess, American uh, yeah, genre, whatever yeah. it is. You went through Goodfellas and then, Alt and then finally, and, and to some extent, Raging Bull dealt yeah, with those yeah, themes, and then extent. finally, Casino. Casino. And I wonder if you've seen in your own work uh, a reflection of that evolution in a very limited genre with the same person that you're collaborating with. Have you seen your message change or the way that you look at the world change? Not consciously. I mean, we look back at it now, and ultimately, the impulse on Casino was the sense of, uh, uh, of that world of Vegas at the time being sort of a, a kind of a rep representing unlimited greed, um, what could be construed as uh, certain aspects of a country, a country at this time, or uh, what is, how much do you need to be, to be satisfied? It's a uh, that's the idea, and so in a, sense, in a sense, we go from the street corner guys in Mean Streets uh, to Raging Bull, which is uh, more to do with boxing, but has a lot to do with the it still make boxing It still with possible. the selling of the soul and the Faustian bargain Absolutely. with the mob. Yeah, and, and they lose paradise in Casino. Yeah. I mean, the paradise is paradise for bad guys too, right? So, mm -hmm. but they lose it, they blew the whole thing. And in, in so doing, um, uh, in a sense, it's given up to a bigger evil, really. Uh, the one that is the tourist, uh, uh, tells the tourist to come here, spend the money, uh, right. spend your kids' uh, tuition on, on a couple of games. It's the, much more nihilistic, though. Yeah, Even yeah. though Mean Street has, has much more, uh, the violence is more off-putting because you're dealing with your leads and it's confusing and there's not that inevitability, or maybe there is that inevitability. Uh, the, there's much more purity in the characters, I think, and in Casino, it's you just feel by the end of it, you no, just feel like you can't root for anybody. No, no, I know that's a Paul Schrader point. I said, Marty, I, I, that people can't keep making pictures, three-hour pictures about people they don't care about. <laughs> and I said, Paul, what? You? I said, you don't like the film? He said, No, I saw it three times. So, well, I, the thing for me was that, yeah, I, I love the movie, you know, but, but I, all the characters I, are compromised. Oh, though. they're bad. Yeah. They're compromised from yeah. the beginning. Here, the guy's talking about paradise, and they're in hell, basically, mm -hmm. but it's their hell, you know, and they're having a great time in hell, and. The thing about it is, like, it, it, this issue, the issue of, um, the issue of uh, overconsumption, the, someday we turn the car on, it's going to blow up, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and that's, that's where they're headed. That's where they're headed. Have you been involved with testing uh, and scores? Yeah, since, and, uh, uh, since Color of Money, um, Goodfellas, we, we screen films for preview. What do you think of the testing process? Is I, it helpful to you? It's you? helpful. It's, it's not very... My films, are, I, I find, are very difficult in the testing. We have to determine through the cards what certain phrases mean, a repetition of certain phrases. Some may be reacting to the psychological, the subconscious reaction to splices jumping. Right. You know, uh, some in people might... In the work might, print, yeah, you mean. In yeah, the work right, print. Right. Or some will be reacting saying, I don't like that. So what scenes you don't like? And they mention scenes they don't like. Well, then we looked at it after about two or three movies. We said, well, that's a scene you're not supposed to you're like. You're not supposed to like it. He's you're getting not killed. You, yeah. mean, you mean, yeah, the guy's getting killed. You don't like Of course you don't that, like that it. That kills that's me, too. They say, who yeah. don't you like? I don't like the bad guy. I don't guy. like the bad guy. Well, yeah. the bad guy, that's what it that's is. Good. So, so the studio gets, oh, my God, the bad guy. <laughs> Look, they don't like that. So, well, that's a scene you know. Well, can you make it shorter? Yeah, oh, God. I mean, on, good, on Goodfellas, we had that problem, and the, the, the previews were uh, very bad, and uh, um, people got angry. That's amazing. Uh, big, well, because they weren't prepared for it. And it, it's, an, it's, an offensive, it's an offensive film if you're not prepared for it, because it, it glamorizes seemingly that lifestyle, and people got very upset. Um, it, when you, the, the issue of more money involves more, uh, if the script is not solid, then you do wind up in a collaborative situation with the studio mm -hmm. and uh, the people all around you, literally. And it's, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people like to work that way. I don't necessarily like to work that way, but very often there's a certain project that comes along that I feel, okay, I'll take that chance. And these are the players. This is the player, that's the player. Are there anybody else? No. Has it, has it been anybody else for 20 years? No. So you want to take a chance? Okay. And then you go into it and you start working together and you start battling it out. And it's a major collaboration. It's a, it's a, these are big pictures and you have a responsibility to, to the people uh, that give you that money. <laughs> I want to make sure that we hit upon this film yeah. because it seems to me, uh, from the way you've spoken about it in interviews, and the amount of trouble you went through to get it made, The Last Temptation, oh, temptation. of Christ. Would you call that your magnum opus to this time? Or? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not... Uh, 
it, there's a couple of pictures I made. That's one of them where I, I don't feel I really finished it. Uh, it's not an excuse, by the way. I just don't think that um, once you get into discussions of um, Jesus and Judas about which is, which is better, which, is, which gets results, uh, the strong arm or love, the ax or love, I mean, that's a conversation that doesn't end. So one scene doesn't really take care of it. Not that you're going to give the answer, but can it be explored properly? Can it be explored in a realistic way? Could it make a point? Uh, not just the obvious, the obvious point. Yes, everybody should love each other, that sort of thing, true. But there are certain problems. There are certain physical problems to be dealt with and social problems and uh, uh, cosmic problems that have to be dealt with, really. And how does one, how does one relate to, and this was purely my feeling, I, I thought that through Kazantzakis' approach on Jesus, the idea if it's uh, fully God and fully man, uh, then it was interesting to me, although that is, what I understand, Christologically correct in terms of Catholic mm -hmm. Church and, and uh, the Christian thinking, but I had problems thinking about, well, if this is uh, the Jesus uh, who dies for our sins, um, if he's God, then there really is no problem getting right. up on the cross and going through the thing, but why did he have, apparently, had this problem in the Garden of Gethsemane that night? He was really frightened. He was really frightened. And so Kazantzakis took that and, and turned it around. And so that the idea was to, to deal with Jesus through the human side. It's, it's amazing, though, that you, hit, that you were hit with so much protest at the time because actually the message, through exploring the weaknesses of the, the, the human aspect of, of yeah. the Christ, yeah. you reinforced the, the greater theme, which was self-sacrifice, peace, loving, yeah. giving up oneself for the greater good. It's just ironic that, that, that your film was seen as something that was undermining, whereas I think that it was, really a, it was really a wonderful exploration of a theme that you've been looking at for your whole career as, as from the, Mean Streets. It's to exactly the same thing, the from Mean Streets, exactly the idea of expiation of sins in the street. You know, you think it's okay to go to church on Sunday for an hour and a half, and then you come out and you behave towards your family or your wife, your kids, your friends in the street in a bad way. Well, that's, that's the religion, not in the church. I mean, yeah, you go to do your things, and the ritual is very nice, but the religion is how you live outside and whether you're, you could succeed at that or not. And it's also very interesting, your choice to put it in the, uh, you know, I know you've dealt with this question before, but, but allowing everybody uh, to have colloquialisms, allowing well, I, people to yeah, bring their yeah. Brooklyn accent to that's it or the southern taste. accent. That certainly isn't. We don't know the Baptist said that. Nobody knows what I mean, what if he was just trying he's not to like say Elijah. Elijah. No, he's not like the whole prophet. He's, great he's saying that the world of God is here now. What I wanted to do is also make comments on, or make a change on the traditional biblical film. Right here, the Jordan River, Elijah sent it to heaven. Biblical film, the screen opens, it's widescreen. Music source, Miklos Rotz's music, which I love, King of Kings. You know, I was shooting this movie, I had King of Kings music going in my head all the time. But we did it with Peter Gabriel, it's a whole other thing. And so. I mean, as much as I like that, it's not my kind of thing. But it distances the audience from the real issues, I thought, especially when you begin to hear beautiful dialogue, probably spoken with a British accent, by wonderful actors, you know, beautifully written, let alone the poetry of the Bible itself. And I said, we, gotta go, we have to do away with all of that. This should be like somebody on a street corner talking to you. Uh, okay, it's more urban, but um, it should be of the street and of the time. Uh, I, think what, I think one of the, the issues that everybody who complained about the film, nobody got to see it. Um, I mean, some people saw it, but... Well, it's not in Blockbuster. I mean, that's no, a whole other issue. No, Blockbuster still would never show it. They, they don't want uh, to insult anyone. The thing was that the, the issue that came out is still, if, he's all, if, it's, if, if it all is all man and his last temptation is about marrying, that means sex is involved. Mm -hmm. And that was the touchy issue for everybody, and that was not acceptable. I take it you enjoy the editing process yeah. more than production? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And more than prep? The, you know, prep is, prep is very important but uh, for me. But you I, enjoy editing? I enjoy the editing. What is your relationship with your editor, Thelma, and what's your process? Does she cut the movie? Do you go in there and cut with her? How collaborative are you? It, we're pretty, you much, pretty much there. I'm pretty much there most of the time. Even um, for the initial assembly? Oh, God, yes, no, we do that pretty much together. Lately, in a couple of pictures, she, I've been asking her to assemble bef before me based on the notes I give her in the rushes, because she takes it down and she types up all those notes, and they're rather intricate. And uh, she designs very often, or, or puts something together according to my notes. And I look and I say, what the hell is that? She said, those are yours, that was you wanted us. Obviously, that's not, <laughs> so we argue, <laughs> how could you do it? Well, you wanted it that way. So, no. so right. you don't need Obviously, to. it's not working, so you have to come up with another, you know, <laughs> and that sort of thing. And so we go that way, but normally, I, I'm in there with her on, uh, means, but, but we didn't do it in the 70s, but since Raging Bull on, and the 70s was myself, and there was uh, Marsha Lucas and uh, 
Tom Roth came in and did some cutting uh, and that sort of thing. But Mean Streets, I edited myself. And some Brian De Palma came in and helped a little. You know, but in this case, with Thelma, it's really, it's really uh, in the latest couple of pictures um, since uh, Bringing Out the Dead, I've been asking you to, to assemble a scene for me without being in the editing room, because I want to catch up. That's very different than most directors who go away. They go I to know. Hawaii for no, two no, weeks, no, come no, back, no, watch I the movie, the and want to hang right, themselves. Right, right, right. No, 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 you, you yeah. can't do that. You have to be there. I, I like that. I, I, I have a relationship with her that she feels comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. uh, other people right. may not, but, but that's what I like to do. Uh, she also understands certain editing design scenes that I've worked out mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, uh, freeze frames or flashes or uh, slamming the car trunk, uh, uh -huh. the trunk, uh, the, uh, trunk uh, of, the, of the car, and it Flash zooms frame, up into yeah. his face and it, everything goes red and you hear a sizzling sound. She knows pretty much what I want to do in that because she's been used to doing that with yeah. me. And so uh, I don't have to explain or... And then she's really the, she's the one with the, the pacing um, and ultimately pulling together the emotion of the picture, telling me that, you know, if we drop that or there's a moment here where he or she, you have all the feeling for the character right there. And I said, I don't know, it's going along a little too long. She goes, yeah, but believe me, that people are reacting to that shot of his face or her face right there. And I know we lose the heart of it if we drop it. And that's the key That's a me. great. That's a great collaborator, yeah. to yeah. be able to keep you honest yeah. in and your storytelling. No, you, yeah. Uh, it took me a long time to understand about cinematography and lighting. Uh, I'm talking with Spielberg one time, and he said he grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, and he realized one morning on Empire of the Sun, he saw the, the mist on the ground, he realized the sun was going to come up like a red ball, and he got that shot of the last kamikaze going out, silhouette against that red ball. And, I, and I, you know, if I see mist on the ground, I run. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker. I'm not going to say, hey, the sun's coming. What do I? I haven't even seen the sun.